Good morning from Countryside Baptist Church. Today we are going to take uh, a look at two different portions of Scripture. So if you would please turn to Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 <clears throat> and then be ready to turn to James chapter 2 verse 14. And as you're turning there, first I want to wish everyone a, a happy new year. I also want to give everyone a heads up that as long as there are no significant post-holiday spikes with COVID-19, we will start having services again on site beginning Sunday, January 24th. <clears throat> I'll give you more details as we get closer to that date. And finally, I just want to say I am recording this morning's message from home and we have some dogs. So if you hear some dogs barking in the background, just uh, ignore them. <laughs> ignore them. They're lovable dogs, but sometimes they can be annoying dogs. Um, so, anyway, for those who can, I would ask that you would close your eyes and listen as I read God's Word. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 says such, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth year, I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left to the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant that are there, that are left to the captivity in that providence, are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down. James chapter 2, verse 14 starts, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of, of daily food, and one of you say to him, Depart in peace, but be warmed and filled, notwithstanding that you give him not the things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Yes, a man may say, I have faith, and you have, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for this chance to share today's message with those here online. And I ask that you'd put aside my desires and, and, and wants and let your word come through, untainted. And, and may it touch the hearts of those who are listening to today's message. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. To start the new year, I want to ask you the question, what breaks your heart? Well, you're, we're usually pretty good at pointing the finger at others when they don't do the things we think they should be doing. But how often do we point the finger at ourselves. How many times have we been at church and we've heard someone say that they have a need or they have uh, uh, someone in their family who is sick and the best we can say is, well, I'll pray about that. Uh, I'll be praying for you. I'll put that on my prayer list. And don't get me wrong, a Christian's most potent weapon is prayer. But the first thing we should do is pray, but how often do we just walk out the church doors, we head to our favorite restaurant for a Sunday lunch, and we completely forget about that promise to pray? I found that we pray for the things that are important to us, and usually the things we pray about are the things that we focus on. And I once saw a bumper sticker that said, if accused of being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict? I mean, is there anything that shows that you are a Christian other than you saying that you are one? You know, Jesus had a word for this. It was hypocrite. In Matthew 23, six times Jesus is going to call the Pharisees hypocrites because they're not practicing what they preach. They lay burdens on others. They don't lift a finger to help anyone. Their deeds are done to be seen by men. They love to be seated in the places of honor, you know, at the seat at the front of the table at the feast. They like being seen in public. <sighs> Hypocrites. But how often 
can we be called hypocrites? How often can we be hypocrites? Nehemiah, he was a Jew, probably a young man born during the Jewish captivity in Babylon. He's got a good government job in Persia. He's serving as the cupbearer to the king. He was a good, moral, honest man who could have remained in Persia. But if he had, we would probably have never heard about him in God's word. Hananiah and the other men from Judah, they were likely at the palace, uh, there to give a report to the king. And Nehemiah sees Hananiah and he asks, how are things for those back at Jerusalem? And what Nehemiah learns breaks his heart. The people are suffering great affliction and reproach. On top of this, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the gates are burned. As Nehemiah hears these words, the first thing he does is sit. And at this point, he could have done several things. He could have told Hananiah, that's too bad. I'll put that on my prayer list. He could have reached into his pockets and gave Hananiah some money to take back to Jerusalem. You know, Nehemiah could have been judgmental. He could have said, you know, this wouldn't be happening to those people if they were doing X, Y, or Z. He could have just sat there and thought to himself, well, you know, this really doesn't concern me. They're so far away, and there's really not anything I can do to make a difference. But notice verse 4 doesn't just end with his sitting down. It says, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah wept. He, he mourned for several days. He fasted and he prayed. And even more, in his prayers, he confesses. Listen to this as I, as I read on. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I beseech you the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast to the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them thence and bring them to the place where I have chosen to set my name there. Remember, Nehemiah was probably a young man born during the captivity. He's a descendant of those taken from Jerusalem. But his prayer is not going to address just the sins of those taken. He's going to confess his sins and his family's sins. He says, we have sinned against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against you. Nehemiah, he not only believed in God's word, but he also believed in the return of the Jews to Jerusalem. He says here, remember, I beseech you the word that you're, you commanded your servant Moses, saying that if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of, of you cast to the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather you thence and bring them to the place that I've chosen to set my name there. God had chosen to set his name in Jerusalem, and God had warned the people that should they obey, or should they disobey, he's going to scatter them. But he also promises that once they turned back to him, he would gather them back together. And that's what's happened here. That's what's happened. The people had sinned, they turned from God, and God had scattered them. Some had been left in Jerusalem, but many of them had been carried off to Persia, but God promises you, when you come back to me, I'll gather you back home. If you ask Nehemiah what he loved, he'd tell you that he loved the Lord, he loved his people, and he loved Jerusalem. And this love moved Nehemiah to action. I'll be brief about what happens next, but Nehemiah is going to request, and he's going to be granted a leave of absence by the king to travel to Jerusalem. 
He's going to get letters from the king to present to the governors for the area surrounding Jerusalem, showing that he is on king's business. He's going to get a letter from the king to take to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, to get wood for the rebuilding of the gates. When he arrives in Jerusalem, he will deal with the threats from those who do not want to see Jerusalem rebuilt, particularly uh, on Thambalat and Tobiah. And he will oversee the rebuilding of the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. James 2:14 through 18 says this, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not the things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yes, a man may say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Nehemiah, if he had just sat, or if he had said, Oh, I'll add that to my prayer list, or here's some money to take back. If he had done these things, things that we are guilty of doing, if he had done these things, we never would have heard about him. But Nehemiah is going to show his faith by his works. Nehemiah's heart is broken when he heard about Jerusalem's condition, a city he had never seen yet truly loved because it was the place where God had set his name. And Nehemiah's heart broke when he heard about the situation of the people. His love for these things lead him to action. His love for these things lead him into sacrificial service. So how does that apply to us today? Well, again, I ask you, what breaks your heart? To all Christians in general, let me ask you this. Does it break your heart to know that you have unsaved co-workers, neighbors, friends, and family? Does it break your heart to know that you have friends and neighbors who, who, who say that they love the Lord, but they never come to church. Members at Countryside Baptist, I'll, I'll ask you this specifically. Our demographic data shows that there are 1,600 people living within a three-mile radius of our church. Hundreds of these are unsaved. Let's do the math. From what I can see beside our church, there are three other churches within that same three-mile radius, four churches total. Now, let's be generous and say that there are four other churches that we don't know about that are in that same area, eight churches. If each of these churches was reaching an equal portion of the population, we should have a minimum of 200 people in our morning service. 200 if we were successfully reaching our neighborhood when we started having on-site worship on the 24th, we wouldn't have enough space in our building for that many people, let alone trying to social distance ourselves. I don't know about the neighboring churches and their attendance numbers, but I doubt they have that many in attendance. Nehemiah, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, he prayed, he confessed, and this moved him to act. Have you done this? As a church, have we done this? Have we wept for the lost? Have we mourned over the empty seats in our church? Have we fasted to be brought closer to God and for his guidance? Have we earnestly prayed for our church and for our community? And have we confessed our sins? Nehemiah chapter 1, 8 and 9 states, Remember, I beseech you the word that you commended your servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, do I scatter you to the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and bring them to the place where I have chosen to set my name. In the Old Testament, that was... That was Jerusalem. Now, in New Testament times, God has set his name at his church. 
Nehemiah, when he's quoting this, he's, he's referring to Deuteronomy 28. And that was a message to the people of Israel at that time. But a general guideline is set that if you transgress, I'm going to scatter you. You know, many things can lead to a church to plateau or to decline. And you know, there can be economic changes, environmental changes. Uh, people may move. You may, may have a declining population. But, you know, it's hard for me to say this, but sin within a church will cause a church to decline. And it may not be the sins that we commit, but the sins of omission. Church members can become prideful. We can get locked into, into church programs that outlive their usefulness. We can refuse or perhaps we fear change. We can get locked into patterns. We can get lazy. One of my former pastors, he would say, the best of men are men at best. If sin has entered a church, God can disperse a church just like he dispersed the people of Israel. Yet, as scripture states, if you turn to me, I will gather you from thence. When we turn back to God, God will gather us together and he will bring us back together where he has set his name at his church. Let's get out there. Let, let us be in prayer for our church, for our friends and our families. Let us do more than pray. Though. Let those prayers move us to action. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that you would break our hearts, just like Nehemiah as he wept for Jerusalem. Bring us to tears for the lost. Move us to fast and pray for your direction. Break us of our pride and bring us to confession. And then like Nehemiah, may we be moved to action. Works don't lead to salvation, but works reflect our love, our love for you and our love for our community. May Countryside Baptist Church and the other neighboring churches strive to reach out in our community. May we seek to bring the lost to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If today's message was a blessing to you, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and forward this message to your friends and family. Again, we will start on-site services on January 24th. I'll have more information uh, with our next week's message. You can also find out more by visiting our website and our Facebook page. May God bless us until we meet again.